Hi from Los Angeles. My name is John Kyo and welcome to number 10, the last interview of the Future of Food 10 by 10 blockchain series. And in this highly anticipated series, I'm going to talk with 10 blockchain companies for 10 minutes to get their views on the key challenges in the food industry and also the key opportunities where blockchain may be beneficial. And today I'm delighted to have with me Lucia Gallardo. And Lucia, you're with a company called Emerge, I believe. Yeah, um, my company was founded in 2018. I'm super excited about it. It's a socio-technology innovation studio, and we're helping public and private sector organizations really connect uh, new and exponential technologies like blockchain to impact areas and uh, and situations like you know rural farms and indigenous communities and and so on and so forth. So super excited about this. Traceability is something we care deeply about, and and it's one of our more popular requests lately. Fantastic. So on your journeys, Lucia, out in the market and talking to clients and doing site visits with customers, what do you see or what have you heard as the key challenges that the food industry has today? You know, in 2018, late 2018, Penta, who's our, our primary blockchain partner and I, we set out to go for food waste approaches um, and try to minimize that and, and look at that as, you know, a primary issue. We were losing so much food along international transportation. Um, but then, you know, over time, I've sort of come to really be interested in this notion of food sovereignty, um, particularly in regions of the world that are either producing most of their food for export into more, you know, North American or Western markets, or regions like, for example, the Caribbean that haven't been able to build agricultural sectors and then depend entirely on imports and the inflation that can happen during you know a pandemic situation and the disruption to to the, that ability to feed your own population i think is something that you know we need to consider as as a as a primary issue obviously there's a lot of you know issues around climate change and production declines and um you know predictions on on how much we'll actually be able to grow over the next couple of years um and then this notion of trust and and you know where is your food coming from what is it going through to get to your hands um, and what is the digital engagement within which the consumer can really, uh, you know, verify that, can connect with more members of the supply chain rather than just the end ones. Um, so I think these are all things that we've been thinking through at, uh, at Emerge. But um, food sovereignty is the one that I'm really uh, thinking about a lot lately. Gotcha. So you, you did that journey starting off with, uh, with food waste and as, as a primary issue, emerged into, uh, into food sovereignty and looking at the challenges of east to west and moving products around climate change becoming an issue inflation becoming an issue yeah. and trust uh, for consumers where is my product coming from yeah. and also that complete digital uh, engagement so we, we'll come back to one of those uh, during the conversation but I, I want to go on to the opportunities yeah. where do you see is the key or the, the most important opportunities where you think a blockchain may be beneficial to the food industry I really think, you know, this is one of those technologies that, especially when combined with other technologies, I think this is something that we need to talk about a lot more is the ways in which, you know, blockchain can contribute to the traceability, the automation of processes, the protected chains of custody for records of sale, um, you know, for how money is moving across a supply chain, um, you know, how data and goods are moving across the supply chain. So I think blockchain really adds a lot of value there. I think you know one of our our bigger pilots uh, with our, our partner Spenta is uh, in Uganda, and and so we're working in a rural area of Uganda across 157 villages, and we're helping farmers that they don't you know they don't connect they don't know a blockchain if they see one, um, but they connect to it, and the way that it helps them is really setting these like first time records of sale to say we can show that you know we are generating income, and when they go to a multilateral you know, organization offering microcredit programs or a local bank or, you know, a, a local lender, then they shouldn't be given the high interest rates that they are given, the punitive interest rates that they're given. So I think there's a lot of ways in which this information defragmentation and, and visibility is, is really furthered by, by a technology like blockchain. So that's where we see a lot of the opportunity. Obviously, it depends on where you want to start that intervention. Who's your client? Is it the farmer cooperative? Is it, you know, the import house? Is it the insurance company? Um, and so is it the government looking for more visibility into its local agricultural economy? So, you know, where you start, I think, is, is uh, it's a whole other ballgame and the solution will look differently depending on who that that starting point is. But I think um, I think the, the goals are really this like notion of defragmentation and and 
coordination of stakeholders and just having like automated and transparent processes throughout all of these different old school, you know, things, because we we're still using paper based processes in so many parts of the supply chain. It's really, it's a, it's a fun thing to observe. Wonderful. Uh, you, you hit on, on many, many things there. And uh, just in, in summary, you talked about uh, it's not just blockchain, but it has to be combined with other technologies. And I think that's a very important point. And you also talked about chain of custody. And I like you mentioned around the chain of money as well. How does money move and how does data move along the supply chain? Because they are crucial. And in, uh, you talked about in combination of those two in a real life project in Uganda, yes. you're actually able to show and help the farmers provide that proof to a bank. Yeah. And you have a more inclusive uh, ecosystem. So I think they're fantastic uh, uh, ideas. And I will come back to uh, that, maybe that Uganda project in a few moments. Now, going back to the challenges uh, uh, briefly, you mentioned uh, food sovereignty. Can you give an example of where blockchain uh, may be beneficial in the, in the food sovereignty issue? Or is it not a blockchain issue? Is it something else? I mean, I think it's a combination of factors. But I think these notions of markets that are unable to really build strong agricultural practices. If you look at the Caribbean as an example, you know, you do have farm farming communities in Jamaica, for example, they have strong coffee, um, you can find lots of different, uh, different crops, there's ocean um, farming as well as a possibility. So I think these, these opportunities to sort of control a little better and set better standards for what is coming in as an import, what are the requirements? How do we help use some of that that traceability component to build a national product for example similar to what maybe colombia did with juan valdez at some point in time to make an offering on behalf of that country to a different one you know if if we look at at a lot of small farmers perhaps they don't have enough to really say we are going to become the jamaican coffee farmers you know to the world um but if you put a lot of these these uh, farmer communities together perhaps you can come in with a nationalized uh you know and many will will sort of take that in, in any way they want to, but essentially you're putting together all of this into one single brand that would be able to meet international standards and requirements. And, and this is exactly the, the perspective that, that Colombia took many years ago. And if you look at the success Juan Valdez has had, I think it, it's really a testament to what can be done. And it can be done even better if you have the right traceability mechanisms in place to be able to do that and still provide consumer trust because of the, the integrity of the supply chain throughout. Yeah. So you you advocate for collaboration across the trading partners. Oh yeah. And also then building the digital ecosystem that supports that, I guess, with interoperability Im embedded. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there are some markets that can really, really benefit from that. I think as we move toward, you know, this this and I think, you know, the pandemic has really contributed to to this notion that, you know, what do we do when the global supply chains are completely disrupted? when you know some ports are completely closed when we can't gain access to certain things and so as a as a country i think you know governments need to be thinking about how we protect our own populations and how we can make sure that we are you know building toward independence uh, independence in, in the food space gotcha we have about one and a half minutes left but i do want to ask you about uganda is there anything you can share that's tangible with that and what what is the success key success factors in that project and, and would you do anything different Oh my gosh. Um, I think the, the first thing that really struck me by that project was, you know, it was coming from uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and they really wanted an idea of what's happening in, in this part of, of their country. And I think, you know, as a, you know, if, as a, a, an entity that's responsible for support services for, you know, trying to export products and trying to build a, a local economy, I think it was important for them to, to see, you know, what strength and capacity this region had. And it turns out quite a bit, you know, we have a target population of 14,000 farmers for this pilot. We're about, you know, maybe five to 6,000 in um, onboarded. But I think the key, the key goal for phase one was understanding, you know, where are they? What are they growing? When are they growing it? How are they growing it? And like, what's their cell plan? And would they be open to looking at all of these mechanisms to diversify the way that they sell? Um, and then, you know, how do they interact with the formal and informal economy and how do we create services that aren't punitive for them to access if they want to diversify their crop, if they lose their crop um, or, you know, what happens? So these were all questions um, that were being asked. Now, the first challenge or, you know, one of was the notion that, you know, there was no Wi-Fi in a lot of the villages. So how do you how do you build a blockchain based system? you know, and, and get them to engage with it if there's no consistent Wi-Fi. So we really had to rethink the dynamics of that. During data collection, a lot of this, the, a lot was done manually. 
And we've moved now toward uh, also some options in uh, SMS text messaging is, is some of the work that we're doing. And then also, you know, the connection to the legacy system from the Ministry of Agriculture. So quite a lot of technological infrastructure barriers and then behavioral adoption uh, barriers to face still. Fantastic. It sounds like a really fascinating project and, and it's amazing to hear five, 6,000 farmers uh, already on board. And so congratulations on that. My final question uh, for you uh, in, in 30 seconds or so, if you were up in front of 50 food CEOs, startup CEOs in the food industry, what guidance would you give them? I think technology is just one part. You have to think about how each you know member of the supply chain is disrupted. It's not about replacing or removing middlemen. It's about really understanding how the dynamics operate and how we can trigger these like sociological changes in behavior that will lead to the use of the technology system. Otherwise, technology is no good. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, there you go. There you have it. Lucia Gallardo from Emerge. Lucia, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom with us today. <laughs> thank you for having me.